I was an ardent reader of Roald Dahl's books as a kid. But as fondly as I feel about them, they have a distinct habit of conflating good and evil with being good or bad at appreciating aesthetic things. Perhaps a bit too much. Take Matilda and Matilda, or Charlie and Charlie in the Chocolate Factory. Both are good-hearted children, mistreated and deprived by a world of TV-watching, chocolate-hoarding Philistines. A book? What do you want a book for? To read. To read? Why would you want to read when you got the television set sitting right in front of you? Or the foxes in the Fantastic Mr. Fox, who are starved by evil farmers and steal chicken and ham to have a banquet instead. <laughs> Or the big friendly giant in the BFG, who is tragically forced to subsist on the awful snozcumber. Or James and James and the Giant Peach, whose evil step ants serve him fish heads while he draws his dreams on empty potato chip bags. We know the witches and the witches are evil because they do perverse things to food, eating pea soup and plotting to lace the candies in sweet shops with poison. The heroes and dolls' stories are scrappy, big-hearted esthetes while the villains are, without fail, the greedy, small-minded, and gluttonous, abusive authority figures who oppress the sensitive appreciators of the world. But what I like about Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, and even more so about the 1971 movie adaptation Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, is that it gets much more specific about what exactly it thinks aesthetic appreciation does and doesn't look like. For example, you have Wonka, who you could see as a kind of perfect creator, and you have Charlie, who's a kind of perfect consumer. And then you have this whole cast of characters that gets taxonomized by their ability to appreciate Wonka's inventions. For instance, the quote, bad members of the younger generation consume unthinkingly, with the entitlement of never having been denied anything. No, I want one of those! And the bad middle generation is too preoccupied with image and success to care about appreciation. They're impatient and vain and indulge their children everything. And the oldest generation is complacent and isolated. They've given up on enjoying things at all. By contrast, Charlie, who's an example of a quote, good young person, appreciates his chocolate. In the book, he makes his yearly Wonka bar last by only eating a tiny amount of it every day, but also generously tries to share it with his family. And Wonka, who's an example of a good adult, is a workaholic in the service of something beautiful. Finally, Joe, a good older person, has a flexible mind, still capable of childlike wonder. This is kind of strange. Yes, yeah, strange, Charlie, but it's fun. <laughs> but there are traits that cross generations, too. In Willy Wonka, the people who are bad at art constantly attempt to prove their expertise, except their boasting only reveals how much they care about the wrong or trivial things. Their motivations are egoistic. Lupa land, there's no such place. Excuse me, dear Mr. lady. Mr. Wonka, I am a teacher of geography. Oh, well, then you know all about it. So on the surface, someone like Violet loves gum, is always talking about the properties of gum. But what she really wants is to be the authority of gum. Now, this piece of gum here is one that I've been chewing on for three months solid, and that's a world record. It's beaten the record held by my best friend, Miss Cornelia Prince Metal. And was she mad. <laughs> where someone like Mike TV seems to love television, a form of storytelling. But what he really cares about is guns and violence and the potential for fame. Look at me, everybody. I'm the first person in the world to be said by television. Here are some other ways that the movie shows ego interfering with appreciation. First, confident wrongness. Now, the combination. This is a musical lock. Rachmaninoff. Second, irrelevant boasting. My dear Baruka, what a pleasure. And how pretty you look in that lovely mink coat. I've got three others at home. Third, cruelty or evasion in order to preserve authority. But mixed together in the right way, as only I know how, what do you think it makes? I don't know, sir. Of course you don't know. You don't know because only I know. If you knew and I didn't know, then you'd be teaching me instead of me teaching you. And for a student to teach his teacher, it's presumptuous and rude. Do I make myself clear? Yes, sir. Good. Fourth, treating the unknown as weird. What's he talking about? Trivial. What's so fab about it? Or disgusting. What a disgusting, dirty river. It's industrial waste, that. You've ruined your watershed, Wonka. It's polluted. It's chocolate. That's chocolate? That's chocolate. A chocolate river. That's the most fantastic thing I've ever seen. 
Notice how Joe and Charlie are continuously enchanted by Wonka's inventions and take them egolessly in stride. Hair cream. They call his inventions things like wonderful and fantastic, whereas the other parents and children try to prove that they're impossible or nonsensical. They care more about outsmarting Wonka than simply enjoying what he has to share. Although Charlie scarfs his food as much as Augustus and wants a gobstopper as much as Veruca, he does so in a way that takes real joy in those things. I think it's the most wonderful place in the whole world. But what's peculiar about Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory is that superficially, Wonka himself is quite egoistic. He's obscure and glib, and his teasing would be nearly cruel if the people around him were capable of detecting that he was teasing. You sure this thing will flow, Terry Wonka? With your buoyancy, sir, rest assured. This is a very different quality for a good authority figure in a rural doll story to have. Wonka does not have the motherly kindness of Matilda's Miss Honey or the grandmother in The Witches. In fact, I would say that the book Wonka is not even necessarily intended to be a good authority figure at all. In the book, Wonka is more of a sympathetic foil for the virtuous Charlie. He is brilliant and charming, but also hypocritical and out of touch, too enthralled with the joy of creation to appreciate Charlie's real poverty or listen to the reasonable concerns of those around him. Whereas the movie Wonka is an interesting combination of virtuous in his own right and downright trollish. Snozwankers. Vermicious knids. What kind of rubbish is that? I'm sorry, but all questions must be submitted in writing. He's a magical artist, understandably frustrated to be casting his pearls before swine. Please, don't do that! Don't do that! You're contaminating my entire river! Please, I beg you, Augustus! My chocolate! My chocolate! My beautiful chocolate! And this difference in characterization is reflected in the movie's change in title as increased focus on the nature and process of creativity. Although Roald Dahl is credited as the movie's screenwriter, the script was substantially edited after the fact, and Dahl is known to have essentially disowned it, especially the depiction of Wonka, much of which was due to Gene Wilder's contributions. It's quite possible that Dahl wouldn't endorse him at all. To get more precise about Wilder's Wonka, compare this exchange with the one Charlie had with his chemistry teacher. The invention, my dear friends, is 93% perspiration, 6% electricity, 4% evaporation, and 2% butterscotch ripple. That's 105%. Any good? Yes. Wonka is being undeniably evasive. He doesn't expect the people to understand his process, and so he doesn't share it. He doesn't even bother to have patience. But unlike the chemistry teacher's evasion, which is a wall that a person can breach with flattery or obedience, things that have to do with ego, Wonka's acts as a kind of filter. Well, 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 two naughty, nasty little children gone. Three good, sweet little children left. The right person will notice that Wonka's flippancy is the real explanation of his invention process. He is saying, the specifics of this experiment do probably matter but actually telling you the specifics would just lead you to cargo cult the wrong things. Say, people who write in moleskins because Hemingway did. But here is the attitude that helps me discover the right process. He is saying, if you can think in this magical, imaginative, irreverent way that values beautiful things, you can probably make beautiful things too. We are the music makers, and we are the dreamers of dreams. People who are good at art, who are good at inventing, are often characterized by this kind of disguised dismissal. That quality that says, simultaneously, you don't deserve my seriousness yet, and, but I'm giving you an invitation to play. People that are cargo culting the impatience of the competent do not leave these sorts of openings. They have no desire to be actually understood, because if they were understood, it would be clear that their motivations had to do with ego and not making something good. The utter disappointingness of most of the golden ticket winners makes Wonka's impatience sympathetic, is understandable. But I wouldn't say that the movie advocates for it exactly, and I wouldn't say that I do either. Meanness might be a side effect of the good thing, but it's not itself the good thing. He'll be made into marshmallows in five seconds! Impossible, my dear lady, that's absurd, unthinkable. Why? Because that pipe doesn't go to the marshmallow room, it goes to the fudge room. You terrible man! I say this because the end of the movie strikes an interestingly upsetting emotional tone. 
Before the ending, the parents repeatedly remark upon Wonka's cruelty, but at that point we are on Wonka's side, and it seems like fun and games. But then Wonka yells at Charlie, and it hurts because we know that Charlie is good, and Wonka is supposed to recognize that. His impatience was only supposed to be for people who don't get it, not Charlie. What good is Wonka's filter if even Charlie wouldn't make it through? And if Wonka values joy and whimsy so much, why would he be bothered by Charlie playing with the fizzy lifting drinks? You're a crook. You're a cheat and a swindler. That's what you are. How can you do a thing like this? Build up a little boy's hopes and then smash all his dreams to pieces. You're an inhuman monster. I said good day. But Wonka is surrounded by half objects during this scene. Half a clock, half a sink, half a lamp. There's no longer any magical music or the whirring of fantastical machines just silence and the ticking of the clock. And we understand that Wonka is just a half-done person himself, imperfect, not magic, and lashing out because a boy he was hopeful about disappointed him. By doing this, the movie moves beyond Wonka and puts him in a context. It becomes something other than a movie about a wise mentor shepherding a child through the stages of his aesthetic development, something other than a movie about how you should do what Wonka does. That would take you right back to the moleskin fallacy. Instead, the final stage of Charlie's development is to see his idol as human, for Charlie and the audience along with him to be disappointed in Wonka the way Wonka was disappointed in the golden ticket winners. It is only after both Charlie and Wonka have had their flaws put under this painful spotlight that they are able to escape the muddling, myopic world and blast off in Wonka's elevator. And in turn, by presenting Wonka in an ultimately ambiguous light, the movie escapes the bichromatic morality of Dahl's books, while still openly valuing the sincere appreciation of beautiful things.